Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here with Dion Nicholas, the co-founder and CEO of Forethought. Um, hey, Dion, welcome. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I uh, want to learn about Forethought and what you're working on. want to learn about you. I always start off asking, what is the toughest problem as a CEO, as a co-founder that you are um, facing today? And there's so many issues today. It could be a lot of things. What's the toughest? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me, John. Excited to be here. Um, I would say the toughest problem is when you think about over the past year, um, everyone shifting to digital and, and remote work, um, as well as a lot of the uncertainty and things happening there um, has led to um, a rise in customer support tickets, a rise in a lot of different things, um, which for us has meant um, having to be a part of the solution. How can we use our AI, and we'll talk a little bit more about what we do, but how can we use AI to help everyone uh, be productive, be efficient, have delightful days at work? And so as you're, as you're working through growing your customer base, even growing your company, have you fully adapted to the realities of what makes that hard during this time? Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a lot uh, that has changed over the past year. Imagine uh, growing a, a startup company um, in in the middle of a pandemic, uh, with respect to having to you know have a, a remote workforce. Uh, most of our team in the past year is actually onboarded during the pandemic. Uh, we grew from I want to say 16 employees about a year ago, and we're now 65 uh, four thinkers today. Um, and so that's meant a lot of change, a lot of growth, and a lot of growing pains. Um, but we're very excited to be here. Tell me about the growing pains. Absolutely. I mean, when you're starting a new job at a new company, you don't know many people, um, and you're doing that all through Zoom. That can be that can be intense. That can be tough. Um, we've also uh, opened up multiple offices uh, at Forethought, uh, our SF um, California office, as well as Lehigh, Utah. Um, and so, uh, just seeing the the kind of growth there, as well as um, you know, as as a new employee what that means for you. I think that that's, that's uh, one of the toughest things. Now, when you say offices, do you mean like offices, <laughs> offices, or like these days, does somebody have an apartment in Lehigh and you just hire them? And so now you have a Lehigh, like, how does that work? Um, we, so it's interesting. Cause when you think about the future of remote work, um, some people, um, th there can be many different iterations, many different versions of it, right? And so it can be anything from everyone is working out of their own home to um, people are, are working part time uh, from their homes and then having hubs uh, or, or things like that. Um, and so uh, we do actually have physical offices. Most of the days, uh, you know, no, no one's using them, so to speak. Um, but we try to provide uh, some spaces for employees. You know, some people have kids at home. Um, and some people have other situations. So being able to provide a base where you can go there, uh, but we have some visible. Right. Did right. I lose you there? A little bit, um, but, but I'm here. So uh, let's get into what Forethought does the core business, um, uh, and I'll, I'll wait for you to to get back with me. I really want to talk about the core business of Forethought and what Dion is able to do uh, with the company that um, started off with customer service and uh, has been able to expand uh, from there, starting to go into different areas. Um, and his background is unique in that he's been able to work at a number of other companies as well um, and uh, and sort of build experience from there. Um, you're back. There we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, John. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, I'm used to live TV, so we, we work <laughs> through we work through these things. So let's get into forethought and the and the technology itself. Um, artificial intelligence, starting off in customer service, vision even beyond that. Why that? Yeah, so at Forethought, we build artificially intelligent agents to help businesses be more productive and more efficient. And as you mentioned, starting with customer service. So our first AI is Agatha, the AI for customer support. 
Um, and why that? So my background, um, I've always been a an engineer by training. I've um, built products and infrastructure at, at companies like Facebook and Pure Storage. Um, and um, so I, I studied machine learning, studied AI. So I think in many ways, I was always going to be an AI person. Um, but the, the specific origins of Agatha and, and this particular uh, problem go back uh, a pretty far, uh, pretty far for me. So my first ever job in high school um, was in customer service. I was stocking shelves at at Shoppers Drug Mart, um, and not only that, but spending just about most of my time answering questions for customers um, and things like that. And so this idea of um, combining my passion for for coding and computing with um, what I was doing in the real world uh, really led to this initial train of thought. How can AI help answer customer questions? How can AI help people at work be more efficient? And, and that was really the train of thought that eventually propelled me to, to thinking about and starting an artificial intelligence company many, many years later. But I think that was really the kernel. There's been some AI work on solving customer service problems for a long time. Like I remember, um, Gosh, it was probably it was more than 15 years ago now going to the tell me offices in Mountain View and uh, talking to them about their plans for you know how they were going to fix some cost issues and things for for customer service over the phone. What are the ways that your approach is different from what we've seen over the past, say, 15 years? So. Over the past 15 years, we've seen what we call automation, but I would actually argue that it's only been very recent that we've seen true artificial intelligence, right? And so with the chatbots of, of the past generation, a lot of them were based on manual decision trees. So as a support leader, um, you would have to go in and say, when I see the word refund, when this bot sees the word refund, go and issue a refund. But if somebody says the phrase money back, I want my money back, uh, or, or demand something along those lines, then uh, the bot will, will literally not know what to do. With true artificial intelligence and natural language understanding, and a lot of this technology really coming about over the last half decade or so, um, you can build systems that truly understand what uh, what the customer is saying, have have uh, understanding of their intent, have understanding of synonyms, of keywords, of phrases, um, and things like that. And then can also learn from past conversation history. So instead of you know the support leader having to go in and code uh, the AI to do something, the AI, an AI like Agatha, can go and look at past conversations um, and see that when people are asking about certain things with certain sentiment, that this is really the answer to their problem. And so this is really leading to a brand new, complete uh, paradigm shift in how customer service works today. Why is she called Agatha? Uh, so we're a little geeky here at, at, at Forethought, but um, we like to uh, have uh, puns around uh, thinking of the future. If you've ever seen uh, the movie or read the book Minority Report, Agatha is the uh, is the precog in, in Minority Report. Oh so, yeah, uh, that was yeah. That's that's where that name came from. Like I was thinking maybe Agatha Christie, Agatha like Christie. solving mysteries, yeah. but you're like, uh, <laughs> there's to, layers to it. There's layers to it. There's <laughs> layers to it. Okay, we got we got a question already, and I just like to if they're relevant to what we're talking about, I like to fold them in. Kelly asks, I've been a vice president in call centers for the past several years. Started on the phones. My question is, what percent of um, and you know, CS customer service, I guess, uh, is is the question here. Will go into artificial intelligence in the future, in your opinion? I think it really depends. In the long term, it's going to end up being 50-50. And so when we think about forethought, um, what we truly believe in our mission is to enable genius in in every human and every workflow. And when you when you talk about that word genius. Um, it really means two things. It means giving humans the ability to live in their zone of genius, to be doing things that truly require human intuition, e empathy, intellect, and those sorts of things. Um, and then secondly, to empower them with the tools that they need in order to outperform, in order to shine, in order to be the best versions of themselves. And so when I think about AI and when I think about automation, um, it's, it's really both those pieces. So automation can really help take away the mundane tasks, the very simple things that really shouldn't require a human at all. And that elevates and enables humans to uh, achieve their true potential, work on problems that are um, intellectually stimulating, work on problems that require empathy and, and, and delighting your customer, and then using artificial intelligence in a different way to support them there. And so I think in the long, long run, 
uh, when uh, when you have products like Agatha and others um, uh, in the market completely, you're going to see that about half the problems or some uh, meaningful percentage of the problems can be tackled by AI. And then the remaining meaningful percentage of the problems can be tackled by humans with human augmented AI. Um, what's the skill set, though, difference you expect that it's going to take to really thrive as a human in that environment? Because the the reputation of call centers now is that a lot of the work is repetitive and you know you're a person climbing a decision tree where the the idea behind the ai you know as you were mentioning from you know your your stocking days is to take a lot of that stuff that is sort of robotic out of the equation right absolutely and so when you think about it Machines and artificial intelligence are really good at making decisions quickly, surfacing up information, number crunching, and things like that. Humans, on the other hand, are very good at empathy, making nuanced decisions, understanding when something needs to be um, you know, handled with a little more care. So an example of that, imagine you're a um, marketplace for, for services. Um, a lot of times when, when customer support questions come in, some of them are mundane, but others might be um, really important. Imagine if it's an issue like uh, a harassment or something like that, where there truly needs to be a human involved to make judgment calls, to be able to support, provide emotional uh, empathy and things like that. Those are the kinds of tasks that humans are insanely great at and AI will be completely not great at. Um, and so that's how we like to think about um, AI here at Forethought is that humans are great at certain things, AI is great at other things, and when the two combine, when technology combines, we can actually achieve and maximize human potential. Okay. Well, let me take a step back, as I like to do, and I mean like way, way back, and get into your personal story. I like to start from like the very, very beginning. Um, where were you born? Tell me about household structure, parents, any siblings? Yeah, so I was uh, I was born in uh, in Toronto, Canada, inner city Toronto. Um, grew up in in what you would call one of the you know statistically worst neighborhoods in, in Toronto. Um, now, wait a minute, what 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 does that mean? Because we're in is, America, like <laughs> like you say, inner city Toronto. I'm yeah. not sure if that's like. I grew up in New York and DC, like in the yeah. in the you know 80s. Like, so I don't I don't know. Paint me a picture. Like, we think of Canadians as being really really nice. Canadians are the the friendly friendly folks up north. Um, no, I mean you know just just going into it. It's it's the it's the ghetto. It's um, you know um, low low income housing, so to speak. Uh, it, you know, as a kid, you you go to school and you 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 uh, focus on things. You work hard. You you keep your head down. But there's obviously you know different situations going on outside and, and stuff like that, uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that are not, not great for kids. And so that, what kind that, of situations that, are we talking about? Take oh, John, you're uh, going really deep into that, but you know, like little, like literal things, like, you know, there, there's gang violence, there's, there, there's stuff like that in the neighborhoods, um, and, and that sort of thing. And so, um, that, that, you know, you know, you're, you're taught as a kid to kind of stay away from those things, um, shy and focus, I mean, really, in, in an environment like that, you really learn uh, from a young age to, to really what you focus on and uh, the work you put in really matters, right? And so my parents taught me to uh, focus on school, focus on education, focus on uh, getting good grades. And, and it's like, okay, this is the environment we live in. But at the same time, through your, your dedication and hard work, you can, you, can, you can get out of environments like that, right? And so- Yeah, um, I can definitely, I mean, I can definitely relate to that. I mean- like we were living in Bedford Stuyvesant, you know, Brooklyn, in the very end of the late '70s, early '80s, and Bed Stuy now it's nice and gentrified. But back <laughs> then, that's you know, it's where the Marcy Projects are. It's yeah. where Jay Z grew up. You know, my dad passed away. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and you know, even getting into the beginning of the crack cocaine epidemic, you know, we yeah. were there, but. Like we were in it, but we weren't of it, right? Because my parents exactly. had a certain kind of focus. Um, exactly. you know, the, the schools that they really worked and, and kind of negotiated to send us to were a very different environment. Um, so we were sort of aware uh, of what was of what's going, going on. on. We, weren't, yeah. we weren't directly affected by it in the same way that a lot of other people were. Exactly. And I, I truly resonate with that. And I think that's, you know, you know, shout out to, to my parents and, and shout out to 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 parents who, who live in environments like that for um, 
those kinds of environments, you know, aren't great for, 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 for kids, but at the same time you learn and you, you keep your head down and you, you're like, yeah, we're in it, but we're not of it. I love that, that phrase. Um, and, and you learn the value of hard work. You learn that, look, if I'm going to, if I'm going to achieve something, um, you know, either I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, become a, a, an athlete or, or an entertainer, or I'm, I'm going to go through school, um, and I'm going to work hard and I'm, I'm going to go a different path. And, and for me, that's, that's what it was. And so I, I took to computers, um, from a very, very young age, my, me and my brothers, we, we played a lot of video games, the, you know, the, I think at the time it was like the PlayStation and whatever. And I got super fascinated with how, how do these video games work, right? Like how, what, what is it, what does it mean under the hood? Um, and, uh, fortunately one of my older brother's friends, like high school friends, he was, uh, he was a hacker. Like he literally, you know, get in your computer style hacker, um, and, and he would be over and we were on our, like, I think it was like a 95 or windows 98 type computer. And, and I would just, and he would just show me some of the stuff he was doing. Um, and, and I got super fascinated. And, and one of the things he, he showed me was like, all right, here's this like game maker tool. You can actually use this to start making video games. And so that was like, for me, like my, my escape, my, uh, the thing I got super interested in, which was how, how to start telling these stories, how to start making video games. I didn't know how to code at the time, but it was, you know, the basic building blocks. Um, and, and I'm really, really thankful and really fortunate for even those, you know, those little helpers in your life where you start to see, okay, well, I can do this. Well, um, in order to make this video game work, I got to learn this kind of math or, or, you know, trigonometry or whatever, when you start getting into 3D video games. And, and one thing led to a next, uh, the next for me, and I really got immersed in that whole world, into computers, into technology, um, and, and then eventually into programming and, and so on. But I, I'm super thankful because when you think about, um, you know, where, where paths could end up, um, it, it could it could it could go differently. Tell me about um, a little bit more about. So you said at least a couple brothers, right? Uh, what what kind of work um, or or interests were being done in the household? Yeah, for real. So um, I have three brothers. I have two older brothers, uh, one younger brother, um, and we were all we were all very different people, and we have very different interests. Like I was into computers. Uh, my oldest brother was into into music and, and and hip hop, and we would we would vibe and and, and jive and, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you know, my second older brother was he's now you know works in construction. So we're all like very different people. My little brother was an, is an artist. Um, and, and that sort of thing. So um, we were just, I, I would say an eclectic group, you know, it was like me, my mom, my dad, and, and my three brothers. And, um, and yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of love in the family, a lot of just like intellectual curiosity, a lot of quirks, even, you know, in that, in that environment, and then a lot of hustle, a lot of working hard. And so, um, you know, I looked up to my older brothers as, as they were doing things, um, and, and try to try to be a, a role model for my little brother. So it was kind of all of us. Um, we all, you know, ended up doing different things, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, super thankful for that, that environment that, that I kind of grew up in. Wow. Um, so tell me about other interests beyond, uh, the, the initial programming favorite classes. I mean, it sounds like math was at least a means to an end, but <laughs> Yeah, for real. So um, growing up, I, I loved math. Math was actually one of my favorite classes. Um, in high school, st also started getting into like physics and stuff like that. I'm still a I'm still a pretty pretty huge nerd when it comes to physics. Um, and then outside of I would say the academics, um, sports was really important. So I would play basketball a lot. Basketball was actually uh, the thing. Me and my buddies, my my old basketball teammates from school, uh, we're still friends to this day. And so. Um, spent a lot of my life. It was like almost like dual dual uh, lives, right? I would spend, you know, as much time as I possibly could, you know, playing basketball. And then as much time when when I had free time at home on the computer, making video games or thinking about these ideas. Uh, yeah, my my friends would joke with me. There's this um, I had a bunch of ideas uh, that that never came to fruition eventually. Like I would make some games and anyway, so a lot a lot of fun. And then I would say the other interest for me was was music, especially with my older brother. Like I'm not super musical, um, but we would, you know, we would listen to hip hop or or other kinds of music. We would um, freestyle sometimes, like stuff like that. But um, you know, really really just into into having fun and and uh, and working hard is really how I would think about it. How did you 
handle expectations. I, I remember <laughs> my parents one time um, came home from some kind of event that they went to, and they were telling a story about how, you know, this they had been talking to this white couple, and uh, they had asked, oh, you know, what are your children into? And, um, you know, they're saying, oh, well, Jonathan likes theater, and, you know, he's into leadership and this and that. And, you know, they said, uh, and what about basketball or football? And my parents were like, no, no, he doesn't really play any sports, but he's really focused on, you know, his writing and he writes poetry. And they were, they were like, he doesn't play basketball. Like they went back. <laughs> and we would like, I'm terrible at basketball. And that, that <laughs> fact was like the bane of my existence growing up in DC yeah. in, in the eighties and the nineties. But I mean, surely people who knew you from the basketball court and being on a team made certain assumptions about the scope or limits you know, sometimes of what your ambitions were or, or what you expected to do. No. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, as a, as a young, as a teenager, it, it can be, it can be tough sometimes overall. I think it's just really important to not put yourself in a box. Um, when I think about, you know, wh whether you call it stereotypes or whatever, um, it is, it is very hard to break out of the quote unquote molds or the expectations that people put on you. Um, but it's so important. Uh, it's just one of the most important things I think is just like kind of following your own path, uh, doing your own story, that sort of thing. I was, I was fortunate. My parents, um, were, were always, always, you know, pushing me in terms of education, things like that. My dad's a, a tinkerer himself. Like he would, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a car mechanic. And so loves to tinker with cars, but also things like, uh, computers and, and stuff like that. And so, um, from my parents' side, I always felt that warmth, that like encouragement that like, go, you can go do your own thing. If it was basketball, then I could do that. If it was computers, if it was all of this, I could do that. My parents didn't even really know that computer science was a, was a thing. My mom would always be like, Dion, you should try to be a doctor or something like that. I was like, I'm horrible at biology. So like, but I, I do know computers. And so they were like, all right, just do your thing. Um, but yeah, the expectations from other kids like, uh, it, it was, it's, it's in the, like, you know, on the playground and stuff like that, where it's like, Hey, being into, into computers or whatever, isn't that, that's, that's considered white. Like why, why is that? Right. Oh, and they so, have that in Canada too. They have that in Canada too. <laughs> You're like, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, I see you. And so, um, it, it's definitely, you know, you, you have a lot of that. You have a lot of stereotypes, you have a lot of pattern matching, so to speak. Um, and it's just really important to just follow your passions through, see it through and, and try to like drown out the noise. Um, and you know, my brothers and I were gamers, so we have that like addictive gamer personality. And so for me, coding was like a game. It was like literally building the game was, was the fun part, the, the intellectual curiosity, so to speak. Um, and so I think that really led me to, to where I am today. And in high school, late high school, I actually had to make a decision. I was playing varsity basketball at our school. We were pretty, very, very, um, you know, we, we did really well kind of, you know, province wide or whatever. Um, and I actually had to make the decision whether I was like gonna go and try to get to the NCAA or the CIS, which is the Canadian equivalent, or whether I was gonna go into computing. And like, I had to make that very specific decision and I actually chose to, to become a programmer. Um, How did and you so, decide? Pardon, how did I decide? Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was my heart. It was like, where do I find, actually it was, it was part heart, part, part head. So one, where do I find the most joy? And I was realizing that as time continued to go on, I was finding more and more joy in, in programming and in computers. In and around this time was when I started thinking about artificial intelligence for the first time and started thinking about, okay, how can AI help me, um, you know, whether it's answer customer questions or help me in history class or biology class, because I sucked at those things. Um, and these were, we, these were things I started to find interesting. Um, and at the same time, basketball was, was fun. It was like where I had all my friends and all that, but like, it didn't feel like the thing that I was, I saw myself doing 10, 20 years from, from today, uh, or from that day. And, um, and so like, that was kind of how the choice was, it was a function of like, where's my heart at? And realistically, where can I, where am I going to find a job? Like, I don't know if I'm that good that I'm going to go to the NBA. Um, but I think I could be good enough in programming. And so it was like, I had to make that bet on myself. I started doing um, uh, programming Olympiads. So uh, in, in high school, they have these programming competitions um, and things like that. And University of Waterloo, which is my now alma mater, was like kind of hosting all these math competitions and programming competitions. And they were whipping my butt. Like it was so hard, but I just got 
into it. And the, the harder it got, the more interesting it got. And so I saw myself being pulled in that direction. Um, University of Waterloo became a dream school for me. So I ended up um, really, really wanting to go there, uh, went there for university, continued on that programming Olympiad path. Um, and I, I truly think, you know, the rest is history. Happy to, happy to talk more about that. But I honestly, you know, <laughs> being able to have this conversation today, I, I feel truly fortunate and blessed that that, that was the right choice. I keep hearing about University of Waterloo in relation to a number of different companies, probably for the first time connected to RIM and BlackBerry. And uh, my impression of it is it's kind of like the MIT of Canada and so much technical talent, so many ideas come out of there. Is that the sort of presence or, you know, that it had influence that it had in your life? Yeah, uh, quite frankly, and and we, we, yeah, we we as uh, as Waterloo alumni like to like to call ourselves the uh, MIT of Canada, or maybe the MIT is the Waterloo of, of USA, but that's that's right. okay. <laughs> but um, no, nah, I'm kidding. But yeah, like it really did have that that presence, and and it started for me in high school with these the math competitions. They were hosting it. They were always the ones you know pushing that um, the computing competitions. Um, and, and I was just like, all right, if they're, if they're whipping my butt this hard in, uh, in, uh, in high school, well, that's where I want to go for, for college. And that was it. I just followed that passion followed that, that love for, for computing and what we were doing. Um, and then when I got there, it was even a whole, it was like even more than I expected. And I think what I, what the biggest uh, thing that I'm starting to realize and that, you know, if I ever tell younger versions of myself, this is that. Um, networks matter. And, and it's weird to say that. But what I mean by that is when you're surrounded by a bunch of people who are trying to be the best versions of themselves, you're going to get pulled up. Right. And so, you know, I, I would go to school. I had a ton of imposter syndrome just like throughout all of this. Right. The only the thing keeping me going was that I had this personal passion and all that. But like, Why you know, imposter really, syndrome? <laughs> pardon? Why? Why did you have imposter syndrome? Why imposter syndrome? So um, a lot of things. It was kind of like at every point in, in, in my life, you know, whether it's you, you go into to a classroom and you're like one of the few black people in the class or something like that. Right. And you're like, OK, literally visibly like, OK, I'm not even sure I belong here. Right. And, and then um, it's the 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 people telling you, hey, computers are for, for a different type of person or whatever it is. Like, are you sure you're you're supposed to be doing that? Right. There's all these expectations put on you. And so as I follow my my interest, my passion for computing, for computers, um, at every point in the at, at every point, it's me looking intrinsically for that motivation and very rarely seeing externally, you know, other validating factors. And it's like, okay, I don't see anything. I'm actually not sure I'm in the right room, but I'm kind of gonna just be here anyway and do what I can do. Um, now, is it literally is it literally people saying this area isn't for people like you? Or is it just the setup where you walk in and you're the only person like you that's there? And the implication from some people is, oh, how did you get here? Right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's more of the the latter, right? It's more of just the the setup, the the, you know, the the unseen social structures type things. And and also, you know, from your upbringing, right? I think there was a lot more of that when you're when your kids on the playground, so to speak. Um, but a lot less of that when you start to go into um, the kind of, you know, academic world or whatever, but though that, that structure, that setup, that walking in and not being sure is, is always there. Right. And so, um, it was definitely for me, one of those, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Cause I like have an intrinsic motivation. Um, but you're always, you're always like, you know, that subconscious second guessing yourself. Um, and that, that, that was always the interplay for me. It was like, all right, kind of low confidence, but I'm just going to kind of do my thing anyway. And, and it, that, that was the balance. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, you make friends and again, being in an environment where everybody's pushing, you start to see, okay, that person, that person's pushing in that way. I can do that too, maybe. All right. And I'll, I'll go try that. Um, the perfect example of that was, uh, when I, when I got an internship at Facebook. Um, so I was on the competitive programming team, the, the international collegiate programming contest team at, at Waterloo. And some of my teammates, it was actually just a common thing at Waterloo to go and apply to Silicon Valley companies. I'm just going to like say that. And that was like baffled my mind um, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, <laughs> as it's just a common thing. Because again, like, you know, the MIT of Canada, they have an amazing co-op program where you'll, you'll do school and then work a term and then school term, then work term, school term, work term. And usually it's, at, you know, whether it's research in motion 
or at a Silicon Valley company like a Facebook or Google, the top students were just doing that. And that was just a part of the culture, a part of the nature. You had recruiters coming, everyone was recruiting out of Waterloo. And so I didn't know any of this so again, cause I just went there cause I was like, all right, this is like my passion. This is what I want to do. Um, but friends on, on my programming team were like, yeah, yeah, I'm applying for an internship at Google or I'm applying for an internship at this company or that company. And I'm like, oh, that's that's crazy. All right, you go do that. Have fun. Like, that's that's uh, that's your thing. And they're like, Dion, why, why aren't you applying too? And it's like, who, me? Like, you know, and so those sorts of things. And I'm super grateful and fortunate that I was in that environment because, yeah, your friends are like, yeah, I'm applying to this company. Why not? Why, why don't you do that? And so that actually is literally how it happened. Um, so applied to Facebook. Um, fortunately, you know, got an interview. I still remember being terrified. Uh, like literally in the in the interview, it was like a coding, um, kind of a virtual coding session where you do an algorithms thing. And my hands were physically shaking. I remember this. And and my mom, because uh, this was a, uh, I, I think I was back back home for some reason. But my mom was literally upstairs listening, like to see how the the interview was going. And my hands were physically shaking because I was like, oh my gosh, this is an interview with Facebook, and. The craziest thing, though, was when I when I finished that interview, I was like, oh, this is it. And not to sound cocky or anything, but I had been doing um, competitive programming, Olympiad programming for for years up until that point, since high school up until uh, then. And and the Olympiad programs compared to uh, or pro Olympiad problem sets compared to an interview problem set, they're actually just much harder. It's just like, you know, straight up much harder. And so when I did the the interview problems, I was like, oh, like I know how to do this. And so, again, it was this. I'm not sure if I belong here, but like if I just sit down and do it at the end of it, hands shaking still, I'm like, oh, like I did it. <laughs> right. And so kind of kind of crazy how that happened. And, you know, I was fortunate to eventually get that internship at Facebook, um, you know, had an amazing, had an amazing summer. Yeah, sounds like you earned, sounds like you earned it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that, John. I, I, I truly do. So, um, yeah. And so. Um, yeah, I like, you know what I did, I did earn that. And so, um, you know, I should tell my, my younger self that, but I, I do feel proud about that and, 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 you know, happy to talk more about that story or, or, or a couple of things, a couple of things in what you said, one is preparation. Um, and it's the idea of you not only had talent, you know, to, to whatever degree, but you were like competitively coding, you, you were getting the equivalent of what you were getting on the basketball team that prepared you to have to make the decision. Am I going to take this to the next level? You got coaching, you got, you know, you got your game lifted by the people around you. You got the right problem sets to stretch you. Um, to what extent is that a kind of missing opportunity ingredient you think um, for the people who never get a chance to have imposter syndrome because they never get to the University of Waterloo moment. 100%. And that's why it kind of goes back to what I think network matters. So, you know, now I'm an entrepreneur and, and like, I, I see I see these patterns over and over, whether it was in basketball or whether it was in competitive programming or whether it's now, you know, building a startup. I think it's just so important. You got to you obviously have to have some ability. You also have to work hard, like literal, you know, they say 10,000 hours Well, you're putting in your 10,000 hours, right? When, when I was doing competitive programming, a single contest can be anywhere from two to five hours and I would do two to three contests uh, a week, right? Or, or, or more, right? And so, you know, you go to school at the end of the day, you're reading your algorithms textbooks. I would read the third and fourth year textbooks um, in my first year just so that I could figure out how this all worked. And then I would go and do a contest. And like, that was it day in and day out the same way it was with basketball, whether it was, you know, you're done school and you go and you hit the gym and you start putting up a hundred shots. So there's all of that, but there is that missing ingredient because if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know, Hey, you can go this way or somebody watching out for your mistakes, or you're seeing somebody do something differently than you might've done it. You're, you, you do um, limit yourself. And so in so many ways, whether it's, you know, in technology, finding other great programmers, if you can, um, you know, reaching out to folks, um, you know, th maybe it may, it, that's a hard thing, right? Because not everyone has that opportunity. So um, we can we can state that. But that being said, if it's if it's available, if it's uh, a possibility, whether it's, you know, cold emailing people on LinkedIn, finding experts who are willing to go out of their way and help you really, really matters. And the same is true for tech entrepreneurship, whether that's finding other founders or investors or things like that. Um, and, and the same was true for me, you know, in in uh, in competitive programming. Let, let's talk trajectory. So you intern at Facebook, 
Um, you intern at Palantir, uh, great names. And then you do you come out and work at Dropbox? Yeah, exactly. So um, after school, uh, I did about a, uh, I worked at Dropbox for a stint, um, working on their uh, collaborative um, kind of commenting, note taking features, and things like that. Um, and then um, after that, uh, went to Pure Storage uh, for a couple of years. Um, so helped build their second product line, uh, which was the Flashblade product line. Um, and and then from Pure Storage is when I actually uh, took the leap and, and started Forethought. Now. Did you always intend to start a company or were you like going in intending to be like a, a 10 year or a lifer at, at Dropbox and Pure Storage and then just go, no, maybe not? <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's actually yeah, more, more the latter. Um, I like to say, and, and this is true, I didn't know entrepreneurship was was for me. Again, it's always it's that um, you, you can't be what you can't see in, in so many ways. And so. I, it wasn't a thing that I thought I could do, so to speak. Um, but in so many ways, I was already doing it, building video games, building you know textbook readers, building all this stuff. Um, I was doing some form of entrepreneurship my whole life, and I didn't I didn't realize that. I didn't label it as entrepreneurship. I didn't call myself a CEO. Like a CEO was was another kind of person. Um, at the same time, though. I think I was always, you know, kind of meant to to do that in, in some ways. Like again, because all this stuff I've been doing is some form of entrepreneurship. So yeah, I actually I was like, all right, I'm gonna become a software engineer, work my way up, you know, do those things and just like just be a software engineer, just chill. Like that was like my career trajectory, my path. Um, and then I think I never uh rested, so to speak. I was always, you know, solving problems, um, so to speak, and always trying to trying to basically I was I was always being an entrepreneur um, and so um, did did this into Dropbox at pure storage again because we were building this brand new product it was a little bit more of a startup environment like a smaller kind of company within the company and so I, I got to see what it was like to literally start from something that was in alpha from basically from scratch and see it launch uh, to to a company and I was like oh this is this is this is interesting um, and so uh, eventually I did become an entrepreneur at the end of the day. And I think some part of me, whether you want to, you know, call it the, the universe, uh, so to speak, but some part of me was kind of always moving towards that. Um, but I didn't know it. I didn't know that that was, you know, where I was going to end up. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a universe guy in, in that sense. Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. like from, from the number of entrepreneurs I've talked to, it, it's like often either they're like Tony Shu, he's in school at Stanford with a bunch of other people. They got some ideas, people who specialist, who are specialists over here, who are specialists over there. They start brainstorming, they have an idea, and out of maybe the group of friends comes the drive. And you know, somebody's got a relationship that that you know out, outside it with an investor or somebody that helps to elevate. Like it's it's not the universe so much as it's <laughs> the right brains, the right people, and somebody believes. I mean, what are the ingredients for you? That's a that's a very good question. Um, so I, it, part of it goes back to this pattern that I think I, I started to develop from basketball, from coding, uh, competitive programming is is you you pick a problem. Uh, so usually I mean, usually you don't pick the problem. The problem picks you uh, in, in that like it's something that you're interested in, you're obsessed over. Um, you obsess over it. You put in those ten thousand hours, and then you also surround yourself by people who are who are working towards solving that problem as well. Um, and that that kind of becomes a an ingredient um, in and of itself for for whether you want to call it success or, or otherwise. Um, that that has been a has been a recipe for me. And so um, for me, uh, there were there were a couple things, right? So I, I met my my uh, now co-founder Sammy Ghosh. Um, at Palantir, we were both interns at Palantir. Um, he, for you know, he's a Harvard computer science masters, um, top of his class, an insanely intelligent guy. We bonded over basketball, uh, of of all of all of all the things, but we also bonded over over ideas, over enterprise um, AI things like that. And so over the years, we didn't end up, you know, we over over the years. Um, we we always bounced ideas um, back at each other and that sort of thing. So that's you know that's the people aspect. 
Um, second is is the problem aspect. And so again, from from stocking shelves and working in customer service to um, AI that I, that I had built in in school to help me study, um, there was always this train of problem of like, how can AI help anyone become smarter? How can AI help customers get their questions answered? How can AI help workers, whether you're an engineer or support agent um, or an HR uh, business partner and so on? And that that train of thought literally, you know, never never went away, right? I would I would learn about this thing called natural language processing. And this was, you know, for fun, whether I was working or, or otherwise, I would go and read um, Chris Manning's, uh, Chris Manning is the Stanford professor who, who wrote the book on, on NLP and information retrieval. He's actually now one of our advisors at, at Forethought, but I would go and read his, his textbook. Like I read all of his books, I would go and do that. And you can see the pattern, like whether it was algorithms, um, but I was starting to get interested in, can you actually build AI that maybe understands things like a human, can ask or answer questions like a human? Obviously, you know, that that sci-fi ideal starts to, is, is pretty far out, but you can start building things on the way there. And so I really started getting obsessed with this idea of AI, I think is gonna have a huge impact on everyone. Um, and AI can help bring out the genius in everyone. Um, and, and, and so I started kind of wrestling with that problem until it, until it, uh, until it uh, became the thing that I, I really needed to solve. Um, and, and, and I started Forethought. And so that, that's kind of how it, how it uh, came about for me. So what's, the, what's the bridge between imposter syndrome and so I started Forethought and then the CEO? <laughs> Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. It's like, what, what is, yeah. So. There, there's some, there's, there's some connected piece in there, including, and yeah. this is what trips a lot of people up. A lot of people say this is the hardest thing. The first investors. 100%. And so, um, again, it always goes back to people for me. Um, so you, you have the ingredients, you have the, maybe the capacity, the idea and all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think a lot of things happen as a function of serendipity, not, not luck, but like being in the right place. Maybe that's because you were prepared, um, but being in the right place, knowing, getting connected to the right people, um, and so on. And so for me, I was, I was, I would say very fortunate. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll use that word again. Um, as I was thinking about these early ideas, um, you know, starting to think about the, the kernel of what forethought would be, I had, you know, I didn't really know anyone in the tech ecosphere or whatever. Um, but I had uh, one one friend who um, was a was a tech founder himself. He was actually a former competitive programmer um, and, and a pretty high, high eventual um, high exec at, at Quora. And so this friend uh, Vlad is his name. Um, we we'd gotten to know each other through competitive programming. He had hosted a competition, um, and I had ended up doing uh, pretty well at that. And so we we'd gotten to know each other. Um, but he was already in the tech world. And so, you know, we, we got to know each other um, and I started telling him about some of the ideas I had because, you know, this is fun for me, like talking about tech, talking about ideas. And, and he would say to me, hey, Dion, why don't you, why don't you go raise funding? Why don't you go and, and, and uh, apply uh, to YC or something like that, right? And, yeah, yeah. and for y me- Y for the uninitiated. <laughs> y Combinator and an Accelerator program. Yeah. And to me, it was like before, prior to that, it was just not even in my head, not a, not a thing, didn't even know it was possible. But, you know, just having that one person, again, it's just like that one person, why don't you just go and apply to Facebook? Like, we're doing it. Well, why can't you? You know what I mean? Why, and, and so you have the imposter syndrome, or I had the imposter syndrome. But once, um, and so that imposter syndrome leads me to not even think that something is possible. But once somebody, you know, kind of gives me that, hey, this might even be possible, even if it's like a 1% chance, like for me, those are high odds, right? Like, <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I know how to, I know how to do 1%, right? And then that, that formula starts to come back. And so I start to started to think about that. Um, and so that one friend, he was like, why don't you think about that? And so I started with my idea that the initial kernels of forethought I actually did apply to Y Combinator um, and uh, got rejected uh, for, for whatever it's worth for, for, the, for the history books. Um, but again, that didn't stop me again, because that's like, okay, that's 1%. I just, you know, fell in that 99. You, you just need, you need a, a hundred iterations before you start getting, getting anywhere. Right. And so, um, that, that's what started happening. So I started to go down that train of thought. I was like, I think I can solve this problem. I think it's actually going to be a huge, massive problem, whether you're, you know, stock in shells, whether you're responding to customer support inquiries at a bank, um, whether you're an IT service manager, I think AI can, can do this. And, and so that was it for me. It clicked. Like it was like, it went from not being 
uh, thing that I even thought I could do to the point where I still like wasn't sure whether I belonged in the room, belonged as a CEO, but I was gonna I was gonna go try, and and, and I think that was it for me. And so went and did that, got rejected from Y Combinator, um, but then started to figure out, okay, well, how am I gonna raise money? How am I gonna have investment? That sort of thing. Um, and uh, and I think the the the, the rest is is kind of history. Although I don't know, we could we could dive into w uh, where we ended up landing with with investors. Well, let, let's get to that. But um, before we do, or maybe on the way there, I, I like to ask if you've had a Death Valley experience, kind of lowest point, um, something in either your education, your career, even outside that, if need be, um, floored you and really made you think maybe this thing I've been pursuing isn't the right thing for me. Maybe I can't hack it. Has, has there been a moment like that for you? Um, many, <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of funny though. Cause I think I'm an optimist or, or, or maybe, maybe it's, it's repressed, but, um, when things like that happen, I kind of just like, you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm kind of floored. Um, but then I just get back, I like, I get back on the horse, so to speak. And it's kind of, it's kind of maybe a weird quirk of my brain, but in every single one of these, you know, things that you would call successes, they were like, you know, it takes 10 years to build an overnight success. But, uh, but it was like 99 failures before getting to one success. And, and so each and every time it was like, dang, you know, this is, this is hard, right? And so I'll use competitive programming as an example. Um, throughout all of college, I, I, I actually kind of sucked at competitive programming, but like you see that up and to the right um, progress. And so you, you have contests every single week and I'm usually doing pretty poorly. Like I'm getting beat down every single, every single day uh, that I do a contest. I'm not, you know, in the top one or top two, there's a hundred people I'm in, I'm in 75. Right. And so each of those moments are, are actually pretty painful. Um, and then eventually, you, you know, you have one big contest, another big contest, another big contest. And then all of a sudden, when you look back, you're like, okay, I did it. I'm, I'm 13th in the world at the Olympics of computer programming. Right. And so that was, um, I've had many moments where, you know, I felt I couldn't do it. And the same was true for for forethought, I think that first uh, fundraise was was very very intense for me. So after you know after YC, um, as a side note, um, you know uh, my wife and I we got married in our twenties. We actually you know had a boy. We have two kids now. Um, so our, our boy is uh, is three years old. Our, our little girl is one and a half. But um, if you kind of roll the clock back three years ago, three and a half years ago, that was literally right after I got you know rejected from YC. So I had just had a uh, you know baby so to speak. Um, how, it's like, okay, I want to do this startup. How am I even going to be able to raise funding? Because like, if, if I don't have funding, like there's no way I can go and do this. And so it's like all of that. Um, and and so I, I went and I, I fundraised, um, spoke to investors, learned how to tell my story, tell the pitch, um, paint that vision of what AI can be. And then eventually uh, landed an investor in, in K9 Ventures, um, one of the most phenomenal uh, early stage investors on the planet, Manu Kumar, uh, who's, the, who's the partner there. Um, and, and really clicked, um, and, and the rest, like, honestly, I'm, I'm so grateful that, um, investor self-select is like what I like to say. Um, and so having, having folks like Manu, um, and, and Vlad, the, the guy I mentioned who was our, you know, the first guy who pushed me ended up becoming one of my first angel investors and, and stuff like that. So eventually, you know, you get there after being beat down maybe 20, 30, 40, 99 times, it's that a hundredth time that you, you kind of, you get back up, you do it, and then oh, oh dang, okay, I did it. I, I won this contest this time, and then and then I'm going to keep going. And so that's kind of that's kind of how it is for me. Um, that key investor, what was the connection there? Was it just knocking on doors? Was it uh, an angel that you had that had worked out for them before? Yeah, that's a that's a great great question. So again, it it all boils down to like you you build your network one one kind of node at a time. If I'm using you know graph theory from from computer science, um, and so let's say you know my my one friend I met uh, introduced me to other folks. Um, somebody that I used to work with introduced me to somebody else, and you're really just hustling and building that network. Um, in this particular case, um, I, I, it, it's you know long winded story, but. Um, there was a company that was trying to hire me. Um, they were an early stage startup. They were trying, uh, you know, we were, they were talking to me and I was like, no, I'm, I'm actually going to go start a, start a company. Um, they introduced, they're like, okay, fine. Here's a, an angel investor or two that might be helpful. Um, and so I ended up meeting uh, Sumit Gadra. 
They, they, they're like, like here's an you want to hire you? You say no, and they're like, all right, fine. Here's an angel investor. Yeah, that's like this. This actually happened. I mean, Silicon Valley why, is a wonderful place, but why would I, they do that? Um, I think a lot of it boils down to. Um, I, I like to use the word serendipity, but when you you and I, I I'm I'm forever going to continue doing this. But if you know if founders reach out to me and they're trying to do something hard, founders know how hard how hard being a founder is. Everyone you know building a business is insanely difficult. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody reached out to me um, and was like, hey, I got this idea and I see some you know some potential in that person and they they need a nudge or a help, then I'm going to go do that because that's what people did for me, right? Whether it's that one friend who teaches you about computers or that one friend who pushes you to go and apply for Facebook or that one friend who pushes you to go and apply for Y Combinator. Those are the little things, those little moments that can make or break, can change somebody's life all, uh, at the end of the day. And I'm forever grateful for that. And I like to give back and I like to um, do that whenever I can. And I think that particular founder who um, who, who was, we, I was talking to at the time, he, he I'm sure he felt the same way. And so he's like, all right, I see some potential in this guy. You know, we would have hired him, but he's going to go start a company, which is usually a good sign in that he probably thought I was a good programmer. Um, and so he's like, hey, here's some some angel investors who might help. Um, not necessarily they might, you know, invest or anything like that. Um, and, and, and and one thing leads to another. And so it's every single moment, every time you um, go out of your way to be helpful to somebody or somebody goes out of their way to be helpful to you, it creates another connection, another bond. And that's that, you know, social capital, so to speak, that network um, that builds. Um, and so um, nowadays, you know, we've we've raised funding from um, K9 Ventures, we mentioned, NEA, one of the top tier uh, venture capital firms, but also, you know, luminaries like LL Cool J, uh, Sean Diddy Combs and Ashton Kutcher and Gaio Series Sound Ventures. Um, and that's like, you know, it's, it's now, three, three, four, <laughs> three, four years later. I didn't hear, <laughs> I didn't hear Drake in that list at all. <laughs> and he's the, he's the Canadian. So right? how, how do you know, how do you know these people? Uh, well, we'll tell Drake to call me and then, then we'll talk, but uh, All right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send him a text. Right yeah, now. But, but it really is. It's, it's honestly, um, exponential growth, compounding growth is, is just a real thing. And it always starts slowly. It, what is it gradually then all at once, so to speak is kind of the, the frame of mind. But again, it, it, everything goes back to, you know, you meet one person, you, you demonstrate value, um, they like your idea. They maybe they don't, but they might introduce you to somebody else who's helpful. Um, and it's just one step at a time. You continue to build a better business. You continue to provide value to customers, and that's actually the most important part. We're not even talking about that, but like your thing has to work. You know, you have to be be providing value over time. But that leads to hey, this one person heard about you either as a customer or they they know a person, and then from knowing one person, then you know two people, then you know four, and then you know eight, and, and exponential growth is crazy after that. And, and I mean, it's not, you know, not necessarily exponential, but um, people are in the business to, to you know, let's, let's say Ashton Kutcher and Gaio Series Sound Ventures, like that's a VC fund, like they, they invest in top tier tech companies. And so um, at the end of the day, they're in the business of knowing good tech companies. And so eventually if you know somebody, you know somebody, but also you're providing value to your customers, then a top tier VC fund would want to talk to you, right? And so it's, it's that's kind of how it is and how I see it is, um, you know, it, it's not, it's not a, it, it's, it's just a long road of building, laying the bricks, so to speak. Um, and then I think good things will come. And also I will say, you know, doing, doing good things for others, you just always, I'm always going to go out of my way and, and kind of try to pay that forward. So I, I try to always tie back from the Death Valley experience what the core belief is maybe that you got out of that. And there was a lot in there. So maybe we can try to boil it down because it sounds like there's a bit of um, just keep at it. It sounds like there's a bit of don't be a jerk, right? <laughs> <laughs> even if <laughs> even if somebody's trying to recruit you and you end up not wanting to go there because you've got a different plan. Maybe if you're a nice guy, they'll introduce you to an angel <laughs> investor. Like, what's, the, what's the core yeah. belief that comes out of whatever that that core difficult experience um, was, whether it's the Y Combinator rejection or, yeah. or something else? So um, I think first and foremost, you tr like it's just such a cliche, but you truly have to believe in yourself. You truly have to bet on yourself. Um, intrinsic motivation is far more powerful than extrinsic motivation in any way, shape or form. And so it's that 
that that is, I think, the core belief is is truly believe in yourself. Some some people, you know, you may not be um, in in uh, into tech or whatever. Maybe you're into to business, or maybe you're into athletics, or maybe you're into acting. But you gotta believe in yourself if you're ever gonna if you're if it's ever gonna work. And that can only come from within. I think is is really the first thing that I would say. And then that second part is that like serendipity is what happens when you know when like you've been when a prepared mind meets I don't know opportunity or whatever you want to call it. But those things. So like continue to put yourself out there. Um, continue to um, get to know people in the industry. Um, and, and you know whether they're going to help you or teach you or, or you're going to be able to learn from your mistakes because you don't know what you don't know. I think those are probably the two things that happen. It's like just continue to grow, continue to bet on yourself, and then serendipity is what happens when you you get prepared and you try to surround yourself by people who are who are moving in the same direction. All right, um, I'll take it. And now before we go, I do want to have a moment of uh, extra Q and A because there was a question from um, far earlier. Uh, that Carlos asked, and I want to get an answer for Carlos. Uh, he says, after 20 years of technical recruiting, I think human recruiters are part of the problems within talent acquisition. Do you think Agatha, or maybe a Agatha has a sister that can hook Carlos <laughs> up, uh, can help solve the recruiting issues for big tech? I am purposefully avoiding using certain terms and acronyms here. Awesome. All right. I'm going to put my glasses back on reading glasses, ready to, ready to dive in. Um, I, I truly, I actually, I think so. So not necessarily Agatha in specific, but broadening out, I would say artificial intelligence. One of the, the big risks for artificial intelligence is when we, you talk about bias in AI in the sense mm -hmm. that like, if there's, if a certain data set or sample is biased and a lot of the times the AI can end up biased and that's actually a true danger. On the flip side though, there's a ton of research that shows when you use structured data. So even like as an interviewer, structured interviews are, are far um, better at uncovering biases than you know fluffier interviews, right? And so when you take that to the extreme and you use artificial intelligence, if there is any bias in the data, then that can actually be um, uncovered, right? And so I actually think long-term by using things like artificial intelligence, using things like statistics like data, you can actually start to alleviate and remove a lot of that quote unquote overfitting um, and I think with recruiting, whether it's diversity, whether we've seen the stats on like, you know, if you change your name on a resume, but it's the same resume, it changes things. That's not going to happen um, for when you start to use true data driven methods. So I think long term, very bullish. All right. Um, hey, we, we covered a lot of ground, which was a lot of fun. Got to know you, got to know Forethought. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Really appreciate you having here. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll be sure to keep in touch. Yes, sir.